This is a fantastic interview about the microbiome, how it affects getting pregnant, your pregnancy, your birth, and your baby. And it's with the CEO and founder of Tiny Health, Cheryl Sohoy. Welcome to the All About Pregnancy and Birth podcast. I'm Dr. Nicole Calloway Rankins, a board certified OBGYN who's been in practice for nearly 15 years. I've had the privilege of helping over 1,000 babies into this world, and I'm here to help you be calm, confident, and empowered to have a beautiful pregnancy and birth. Quick note, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for medical advice. Check out the full disclaimer at drnicolerankins.com forward slash disclaimer. Now let's get to it. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. This is episode number 184. As always, I am so glad that you're spending some of your time with me today. So I am really excited to bring this interview to you today. It's with Cheryl Sohoy. She's the CEO and founder of Tiny Health, a gut microbiome startup that focuses on expecting parents and their babies. Cheryl is an accomplished CEO and serial entrepreneur who co-founded multiple companies, including the nonprofit Moving Forward, as well as a successful consumer software startup that was acquired by Walmart Labs. In 2014, she was headhunted by the White House team and Prime Minister of Malaysia to become CEO of Magic, a $30 million funded agency to spur the innovation ecosystem in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. She is an angel investor as well as an advisor to many startups. Her background, she earned her master's degree in engineering management and data mining and her bachelor's degree in operations research and industrial engineering from Cornell University both on full scholarships, I might add. And she's also a wife and mom of two. Now, I met Cheryl because she reached out to me about being a medical advisor for Tiny Health, and I was so happy to do so. I do want to be transparent that my role as medical advisor does involve some financial compensation. However, that is not why I agreed to the role nor is it why I wanted to have Cheryl on the podcast. If you don't know, the microbiome is the collection of microbes, bacteria, fungi, viruses that live in and on us. We actually have at least as many microbes as human cells. We used to think it was 10 times as many, but newer evidence shows that it's about a one-to-one ratio of human cells to microbes. And I am so fascinated by how these organisms that live in and on us impact our health. In fact, when I was a faculty member in academic medicine at the beginning of my career, I was actually going to pursue research on the vaginal microbiome. So I'm so excited to be a medical advisor and to have this conversation with Cheryl today in the podcast where we are going to talk about her own experience with her own children. She had a C-section with her first and then a home birth with the second. How her experiences led her to start Tiny Health. We will talk about why gut and vaginal health testing are important during pregnancy or even trying to conceive. You'll learn how the mom passes on her gut and vaginal microbes to her baby, what things can impact and change the vaginal and gut microbiome, what is vaginal seeding, exactly how vaginal seeding is done. You'll learn some key vaginal and gut microbes. And then we'll end with a bit about the tiny health test themselves, how they work, the results you get, the reports, and then some surprising results that they have found. I know it definitely surprised me. So as always, you are going to love this episode. Now, before we get into the episode, I want to talk about something that Tiny Health is doing that I think is really exciting. They have launched a gut microbiome study on childhood allergies. And you can try Tiny Health's Research Edition gut test in order to contribute to this allergy research. So the Tiny Health Research Edition gut test, in that you get one baby gut health test kit, and that's for babies ages zero to three. 
You will learn about any microbiome markers that your baby has for colic, eczema, allergies, asthma, constipation, their metabolic health, and immune health. And you'll learn that information in a personalized gut health report that will come with specific recommendations. And then you get some discounts on follow-up samples or mom and baby gut test kit combos. And then of course you are contributing to advancing microbiome science that will benefit future generations of moms and children to come. So if you want to grab the Tiny Health Research Edition gut test and participate, then go to tinyhealth.com. They also have some other options for testing that are not research-based, so you can check that out there, tinyhealth.com. And I have a special discount code to offer you regardless of what test you get, but I would love if you did the research edition test just because I think it's so exciting to be able to contribute to research and and help um, improve science. Uh, For those of you who don't know, I also have a background in research. I did a research fellowship. So I'm just really excited to to be able to participate in this research piece as well. So you can use the code Dr. Nicole, that's D-R-N-I-C-O-L-E, Dr. Nicole, and get $20 off each test you order. You can also use your FSA and uh, HSA, your flexible savings account, spending accounts to get the test as well. And again, head on over to tinyhealth.com in order to do that. All right, let's get into the conversation with Cheryl. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for agreeing to come on to the podcast. We had a fantastic conversation on Instagram, and I was like, we got to continue this on the podcast so we can, can dive in further. So thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, so why don't you start off by telling us a bit about yourself and your work and your family? Yeah, so uh, I'm Cheryl Suhoi, and uh, I'm, I'm a mom of two, two kids, an older daughter who's four and a half now, and my son is about two and a half, so they're two years apart. Um, and I guess should I should I talk about like um, sort of my my kids' birth story and why I started this company? That's exactly what I want to hear. Like, what made you decide to start this company? Because it's a great story. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I, I'm an entrepreneur. So I've started multiple companies. This is my third company. Uh-huh. And uh, I was pregnant with my daughter um, five years ago, and she was breached. Both my kids are breached. Okay. So okay. interesting. And I have a theory around why that is. Okay. Crossing legs and modern lifestyle. Uh-huh. Um, but so when I she was breached and she was my first child, I actually gave birth to her in New Zealand because that's where my husband is from. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to go back there and experience the birth care there, which is totally different from somewhat different from here. Um, right. Anyway, uh, the doctor did tell me my OB did tell me that there's a high likelihood I would end up in a C-section. So I uh, researched and I I took some time off work researched if uh, the, what the, the C-section would mean for her lifelong health, because I remember hearing that there would, there may be some negative effects with the C-section. I, mm-hmm. I didn't really understand why. And um, I really wanted to. Then I uncovered all these papers um, explaining how the microbiome of the mom gets transferred to the baby at birth, um, which is, was fascinating for, to me. And mm-hmm. I can explain more about that. And because of the C-section, my baby would bypass that and not get all the gut and vaginal microbes from me. Right. And also, in addition, she would be having antibiotics uh, during the C-section. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, like I learned that that could be linked to all kinds of chronic conditions for her, starting with eczema, and that might develop into food allergies and then asthma. Um, but really, that whole atopic march uh, of allergic diseases, that's a progression, mm-hmm. um, is a sign that her immune system wasn't really developed or set up correctly in the early days, in the first 1,000 days, because of the disruption um, during birth and with the antibiotic exposure. Right. So I was like, oh, no, would I have screwed up my baby with a C-section? And this is even before I had a C-section. Um, and then right. I, I was like searching for papers, like, okay, is there a way to restore her gut? Um, And then also uncovered all these papers around how I could. And by one year of age, uh, the child, if the C-section is signature, there's something called a C-section signature in the microbiome of the baby. Mm -hmm. If that that has disappeared by one year, then her risk for asthma would have reduced by three or four X. So I was like, I'm going to do all these steps. Sure. Anyway, that's what I did. (laughs) So I felt much better and more empowered as a, a parent 
knowing very well that I may have a C-section. So I, I still tried to, to go into labor because I learned that the baby gets inoculated with my micro string uh, when my water releases. And so that's the first incidence of when uh, the baby's gut gets colonized by my bacteria because the baby mm-hmm. is pretty sterile in a womb before that. So I waited for labor to happen and knew even if I went into C-section, she would have some of my my good microbes. Right. So long story short, uh, and then I did a bunch of stuff like vaginal seeding and probiotics and I breastfed her. Um, fast forward um, six months, she, she did have a mild form of eczema. Um, but, you know, I was hoping that what I was doing had made it mild instead of severe because I do know moms who have kids with a pretty severe eczema. And then um, I did all the steps and I was wishing there was a way for me to look into her gut to see if that mm-hmm. signature has been, you know, has been restored or like uh, is gone now, right? And her gut right. is restoring, but I couldn't find a test for babies. Uh, I only found gut tests for adults. Um, and then I did one for myself actually, because then I learned that there are certain key bacteria that I'm supposed to transfer to my baby during uh, birth and also breastfeeding. Mm-hmm. You continue mm-hmm. to transfer your microbes through breast milk, which is fascinating yeah. too. That's something new that I had learned through this journey. Right. And um, I found out that I didn't have those key microbes myself um, for various reasons. Um, I sure. found out formula fat uh, uh, as a baby. Um, I almost didn't get any breast milk. And then I also uh, had a couple rounds of antibiotics in earlier life and uh, these key bacteria are very sensitive to antibiotics. So that may have explained why I don't have it. So then I knew that, okay, I would my baby might need extra support. Anyway, fast forward two years later. So my son, I was pregnant with my son. And I was like, this time around, I'm going to, I want to start this company. It's, it's crazy how, you know, if, if gut health is so important for lifelong health in the early mm-hmm. days, because now we know that 80% of our immune system is, in our gut and it's dictated by what bacteria we have or no longer have. Sure. And, and it's created in the, in this developed in the first 1000 days, then why isn't there a test to give parents transparency into what's going on? Mm-hmm. So one month after my son was born and this time I had a vaginal birth at home in the mm-hmm. middle of the pandemic, which is the total opposite of my C-section. Um, right. I, I started the company a month after he was born um, and started testing his gut in nine other moms' um, guts because they were all like uh, pregnant around the same time. I wasn't having babies around the same time I had my son. So mm-hmm. I really wanted to do this self-funded experiment with 10 moms, including myself, to collect the data of the mom and the child over one whole year and right. see if there was something significant there that I can then turn into a company, raise funding, and and uh-huh. now a product that other parents can use. So that's a, a long story, but that's kind of uh, right. why I, how I started the company. Yeah. So so often things that we do are related to our own personal experiences. So mm-hmm. it's great that you took your personal experience and decided to help other moms, other parents get information about their own children. So then, why is it important? You know, you mentioned testing your baby afterwards and being able to see if things have, have improved. But what about testing the mom and her gut and her vaginal microbiome during pregnancy and even while trying to get pregnant? Why is that important? It's so crucial. And that's what, you know, we've, I found that um, you should definitely test your baby at birth and over time, in the first mm-hmm. year, especially the, baby, the baby's gut is changing so rapidly and you want to make sure that trajectory is growing in a, in a good pace. And also if you had some sort of exposure and um, antibiotic exposure, then you want to see if they've, their gut is recovered from that. But then, like, as I mentioned, I was, I, when I tested my gut, I was missing certain key microbes uh, that I would have or should be transferring to baby at birth or through mm-hmm. breastfeeding. So now we really encourage moms to test earlier, even before trying to conceive, even mm-hmm. as a you know, regular adult, and you know you, you, you want to have babies in the future to right. test early because if you find that you no longer have those key microbes for your baby's future health, then there are actions to take right now to um, to address that. Right. Um, so through dietary means, so eating certain foods that encourage the bacteria, the growth of that bacteria, 
um, or taking supplements, certain probiotics. Um, and you know, like there's just so many kinds of probiotics in the market. Mm -hmm. Uh, not all are equal. So you don't just take one off the shelf and uh, that, you know, it would serve your needs. It really depends on what bacteria is missing from your gut and what you're, you need for, uh, for health. Um, So we recommend a gut test as early as you can to get your baseline. And then your vaginal, vaginal health is really important too. So as you can imagine, it passes through the vaginal canal. So that is really the first microbes that he or she gets inoculated with and colonized with. So your vaginal community has to be healthy. And this is also a relatively new field in that there is actually stronger evidence uh, between a healthy vaginal microbiome and fertility. So it's actually harder to get pregnant if you don't have the right environment, which is which should be acidic, it should the pH of your vaginal community mm-hmm. should be low. If it's high, then it's harder to get pregnant. And if you do get pregnant with a slight, slightly higher vaginal pH, then there is higher likelihood of pregnancy risk, complications, and preterm labor. Right. And then I mentioned earlier, I did vaginal seeding, uh-huh. uh, which you know, I don't know if you want to go into that. Oh, but, we are 100% um, going to go into that. <laughs> so, uh, I also wouldn't do that procedure. That's basically an optional pr- procedure. Yeah, well, that now, why don't you say like, what? why don't you tell folks what is vaginal seeding? Yeah, yeah. It is it's very new. And, and uh, there's a recent survey done that only 30% of moms actually know what vaginal seeding is, mm-hmm. which I don't. I don't blame. It's relatively new. So this is part of my research when, uh, with my daughter five years ago, um, there is this procedure called vaginal seeding, where if there's a likelihood of you getting uh, a C-section, uh, you could put a gauze, like a cotton gauze in the vagina for an hour before the, the planned C-section, or uh, I mean, even with an unplanned C-section that I had, there was time, right? There was an hour between prep- preparation. Right. Um, so you put the gauze in a vagina and when the baby comes out within the first two minutes, your midwife or doctor or OB or partner can swap the baby's face and mouth, you know, mostly the mouth and okay. area to mimic the vaginal canal route. So you're taking the mom's vaginal microbes basically and fluids and inoculating the baby gotcha. manually. So to me, uh, that makes sense. And, um, I believe the, when I was like researching this, uh, it was a paper, a pilot study in 2016 mm-hmm. that showed that that procedure partially restored the baby's um, gut gut seeding. And then there's a follow up study in 2021, so relatively new mm-hmm. last year, uh-huh. that showed that the the microbiome of the babies born by a C section who did the vaginal seeding was more similar to um, a vaginally born baby. Um, so, so definitely more evidence now, back when I did it, there was very little evidence around it. So definitely it wasn't quite recommended. My OBGYN definitely didn't want to do it, but, uh, he was very empowering and he was like, it's your choice, mama. If you want to do it, you know, you can do it or get someone to do it. So my midwife ended up doing it for me. Gotcha. Um, and it was my choice. (laughs) And it's, it's interesting to me. I don't know why we get so like up and like freaked out about it like it's literally a baby comes through the vagina like it's not like we're doing anything that they wouldn't otherwise get exposed to so I don't know why we get so like um oh my god what's you know what is this crazy thing that you're doing because it's not really that crazy exactly right so I to me intuitively me makes sense um so I opted to do it but coming back to why you would do a vaginal test Anyway, um, there, there are some contraindications for why you wouldn't maybe do a vaginal seeding, uh, which is, you know, if you have GBS, for example, obviously that's the test group strep B, group B, sorry, that you would test around 37 weeks, right? Um, then, then maybe, maybe not, right? Or if you have HIV or any sort of STI, STD, then you wouldn't be a good candidate for vaginal seeding. Um, but also if you have a low vaginal pH, which means you may likely have a community that is not so healthy. Um, so in our tests, we have a vaginal test for trying to conceive for pregnant moms and eat, you know, we encourage you to do it as early as possible if you want to have babies in the future, because it does take a lot more time for the vaginal community to shift. Um, if you don't have um, a lactobacillus dominated vaginal community, lactobacillus uh, is the bacteria that you want to see in like 90, 99% of your, your vaginal community. And also if you 
if it sounds familiar, it is because that's what's commonly found in probiotics. So lactobacillus is what should be in the vaginal community and lactobacillus bacteria creates lactic acid, which keeps the vaginal community acidic. And the acidity of that keeps the pathogenic bacteria at bay. So as you can imagine, if the vaginal community is low in that, it becomes more alkali and it, the pathogens like that. And so then you're more likely to be uh, to have um, the unhealthy bacteria. So so coming back to vaginal, so that's kind of why you know coming back to vaginal seeding. If you have a healthy community, then we wouldn't, you know, um, you know, I, I wouldn't do a vaginal seeding procedure. Uh, that said, the fascinating thing is, so if the mom's gut and vaginal community is not super healthy, we do see that impacting babies. Again, anecdotal evidence for now because we we only have limited data, but just from our data, and we've tested over a thousand babies now, and a handful of that, like a subset of that, sorry, we have the mom's uh, vaginal and gut samples too. So if the mom doesn't have, um, you know, their their gut is out of balance and their vaginal community is in lactobacillus dominated, we see that kind of um, transferring, to, not transferring, but like the baby's gut is in. Um, isn't great either. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So then it's, that's what that, you know, getting back to all of it, this is why testing can help you because it gives you some time, the earlier you test, the better, and you can change things and possibly impact things. And we'll go into a little bit about the test and the test mm-hmm. results, but I want to touch on, so um, during the labor and birth process. So, you know, we talked about vaginal seeding. If you have a C-section, what are other things that may affect the microbiome seeding of the baby, like vaginal versus C-section, antibiotics, breastfeeding formula, all of those things. What are some mm-hmm. factors that may affect how the baby's microbiome looks? Yeah. So in studies, um, the birth mode, which is whether the baby was born by a C-section or vaginal, or vaginally born is mm-hmm. the, the biggest factor. Um, um, but also with the vaginal birth, um, there's no real concrete evidence around it yet, but um, we suspect if there was a lot of interventions, perhaps uh, maybe vaginal exams or um, use of uh, forceps or anything like that, that could introduce more risk for bacteria in the environment entering that um, the vaginal canal and mm-hmm. hence seeding. We we don't know. Again, this is hypothetical, right? Uh, but that can also happen. Um, you know, sort of. Yeah, it could happen anyway. So with the C-section, definitely the baby's not going through the the vaginal canal. And Mm -hmm. the mom's gut microbes enters the baby's uh, system when the mom is pushing, basically in labor. And that's Mm -hmm. why I opted for labor, because believe it or not, it sounds gross, but some fecal fluid has come out when you're pushing, Mm -hmm. right? It's Mm -hmm. why the anus is so strategically positioned next to the vagina for birth reasons, because when, when you're pushing... Some of that does get into the baby's system. Right. And that's why, you know, when you're birthing, the baby gets the vaginal fluids from the, the canal and the gut microbes from, from that, uh, the labor. Right. So uh, some C-section babies, microbiome, the we see the transfer of mom's microbes to baby being higher if they've gone through labor than, say, a planned C-section, which where they don't get any exposure because the labor hasn't started, right? Gotcha. So sometimes moms feel like, oh my gosh, I went through 35 hours of labor and then I ended up in the C-section anyway. Well, know that there, you know, your baby did get some benefits right, from it. Right, right. Um, so for that, okay. so number one, birth mode. Number two, the, the, the second largest factor is breastfeeding or formula mm-hmm. feeding because you continue to transfer microbes from your gut to the baby through your through the breast milk. Yes. And scientists don't know yet the mechanism of how this transfer is still a mystery, but we also see that in our tiny health tests where, you know, maybe the baby was born by a C-section and uh-huh. the mom breastfed for three, six months, and we see those microbes transferring to baby and, and really um, changing the baby's gut community, restoring it mm-hmm. to a healthy state. And that is the number one modifier that get, gets rid of the C-section section signature that I mentioned earlier. Gotcha. And I think that's so that's so important to mention because you don't want people to feel defeated because they had a C-section um, that, you know, they've set their babies up for this, mm-hmm. you know, issues that are going to happen. There's something that can be done in order to help change that. 
100%. And that's my own experience, right? Like I didn't want to feel like, oh my gosh, all the guilt that comes with a C-section that I couldn't control. Um, And like, you know, I had to do all the research and find out ways to restore her gut. And I found that there is a path to doing that Mm -hmm. with the vaginal feeding and the breastfeeding and then um, healthy probiotics. So you can either get probiotics in powder form for infants these days and not again not all are equal you need to get the right strains for your baby right um so there's that or you can do it through diet so when my baby was able to eat solids at six months i i did i made homemade kefir and um made sure she had a lot of fermented foods um there are dietary means to do it too and then exposure to animals nature um, as early as two, three months when the baby is ready is really healthy to diversify their microbiome um, helps. And, you know, sort of um, I've changed my household cleaning supplies to non-toxic, non, um, non-antibacterial cleaning supplies. I don't use hand sanitizers. We don't use antibacterial soap in um, the house. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's been shown to impair the gut microbiome, especially if you have a child. So soap and water is still your best policy. Um, There's no difference between using hand sanitizers and a good soap and and water. Mm -hmm. So all very clean supplies in our household. Yeah, I think that's also interesting because we sort of, our society or culture in a way is like the cleanliness aspect and, you know, you never want to get dirty and those kinds of things. But we're coming to realize that we need to be in our environment. We need to interact and play in the dirt and all of those things make a difference to our health. It's just, it's always been fascinating to me that the microbiome in general, like we literally have more bacteria in and on us than we have human cells Mm -hmm. actually. So it's not that these things are, are always negative or a problem. It's really about finding the right balance and creating a harmony really that best supports your life and your health. Yeah. There's definitely this fear, especially with COVID, unfortunately, right Mm -hmm. around pathogenic bacteria, viruses, and things like that. Uh, But as you mentioned, we, we are, we just have, we have as just as many bacterial cells as they are human cells in our bodies and on us. So when we eat, we're actually feeding our bacteria, not not uh, our cells, but mm-hmm. our bacteria. Really. Um, and you know, I grew up in Asia, and peanut allergies were non-existent. There was no such thing as allergies. Really, right. I mean, I mean, there was but very un- uncommon because right. I guess would get out and dirt and play and you know in the old days too our parents used to do that a lot and then here as we get more urbanized and live in cities mm-hmm. you know yeah like you mentioned we we become so clean mm-hmm. but now with my kids knowing what i've learned i get them they're dirty when they come back from i put them in, in a very nature-based daycare and that also um has been shown in studies to impact the child's growing microbiome Put them in a daycare that has grass and nature and where they're out a lot versus right. in the sterile environment makes a huge difference for the diversity of their microbiome. Right. Uh, right. So now yeah. I'm like, yeah, get dirty, go <laughs> mix with pets and nature. They yes. come back, you know, the dogs will be licking them. I'm like, that's good for you. Right, right, exactly, exactly. So what about the impact of antibiotics during labor and birth? Oh, yes, that's a, a huge one. Yes. Mm-hmm. So so yeah, the one of the reasons, uh, the other reason why a C section is uh, could be disrupting that um, early colonization is because there are antibiotics involved, right? Uh Obviously, when you're doing this, when you're going through a C-section, it's administered through the mom, and it does pass on to baby. Does pass on through the placenta. Mm-hmm. Um, or if the mom had Group B strep, which which we hinted uh, about earlier, right. then uh, she may need intrapartum antibiotics. Mm-hmm. Um, so the science there is it depends how long. So uh, I believe under 12 hours, the impact to the baby is very minimal because it is you know, still a less direct route to the baby. But more than that, there is a little bit of an impact. Um, And then with babies who do require antibiotics directly, Mm -hmm. um, and more commonly if the baby uh, is administered into the NICU, uh, if they're born a little bit earlier and are preterm, then there is definitely evidence uh, that the the early exposure to antibiotics for those babies 
uh, does impact their microbiome. So, you know, we want to restore that even more and we would recommend certain probiotics for that. Yeah. And I don't think, you know, we're taking a stance that you shouldn't do antibiotics. If you need the antibiotics, you need the antibiotics. I do think though, that we need to be, um, make sure we're careful about not giving too many antibiotics and just doing what's necessary. I guess I'm thinking more so for like during pregnancy and oh, a suspected UTI or things like that. Like you can wait to show, to look for sure, um, to make sure you have an infection, like doing antibiotics just in case, um, it is not always necessary and we're finding maybe harmful. So just, it's, it's not quite so, you know, Hey, just take this. Exactly antibiotic kind of thing. It may impact some of your good bacteria as That's well. That's my story. So, <laughs> so when I was in the trimester, you know, I was doing all the regular tests and I think the count for the UTI bacteria, some streptococcus species was a little bit high, but I didn't have a UTI yet. And at the time, my prenatal, um, she wasn't in my OB, but the prenatal counselor was like, you should take this antibiotics just in case. Right. So I would prescribe that. And, you know, I, you know, I'm a first at the time, first time mom, I was like, okay, uh, I'll just do, I'll just do whatever the doctor tells me to. Right. So I did it. And then midway through the course, I, I got UTI and then she, they had to switch me to a higher dose antibiotics. Mm. Uh, and I was like, and that was honestly my first kind of like, wow, you know, I, um, I had no idea if I had known, I would have researched this a, a lot more. Right. And hold back, hold back on the antibiotics because I could have drank more cranberry juice and eat more garlic or, you know, taken a, a vaginal probiotic or did other things or like, you know, drink more water. There's right. just a lot of natural remedies um, because I like I learned now why I actually had the UTI because the antibiotic, the first dose of antibiotics actually uh, probably wiped out even my good bacteria. Mm -hmm. And I actually got the UTI. I was already susceptible. Um, so it didn't help, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you really want to be with antibiotics careful, like what what exactly you're treating and not just like giving them sort of like, hey, let's just try this and see what happens. You really want to be clear. So yes, for sure. I mean, it may have even like, it got an environment where whatever bacteria was actually causing your UTI, it, it knocked out good ones and maybe it gave an environment for the one that caused the UTI to grow because the good ones weren't there to, to help. So you, de you definitely want to be, be um, careful about that. Um, so let's shift and talk about the tiny health test. Mm -hmm. So how do the tests work? So there's gut, pregnancy, baby. So how do the tests work? How do you do it? All that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Yep. Um, so we're in an at-home test testing company. So you order a kit from our website, tinyhealth.com, and it comes to you in a box like this. Uh, and basically you get a swab for a gut test like that looks like this. And um, you, if you're sampling your stool, you're wiping with a toilet paper as usual, and then sampling from the toilet paper. Hopefully you have enough material there. Right. And then you would throw it into an envelope and send it to our lab. Our lab sequences it and you get your results back in about four, four weeks. So we would recommend to do that as early as possible, as I mentioned, um, you know, so that you have more room to address any imbalances. Typically mm -hmm. takes two to three months. So as you can imagine, like the time frame of pregnancy is nine months. Right. Uh, so there, it is a shorter route. So, you know, really early, as early as possible as you can test for, for the gut. And then we also have a vaginal test, uh, comes in the same box and you're swabbing your vagina. Uh, with the, the a longer swab basically and it's not too different from what you do at the doctor's office um and then you get you get insights around what microbes are in your vagina as well so okay. we recommend those tests and then uh you know i think as early as possible and if there was something that you need to intervene like if mm -hmm. you had high or gbs even some of our moms uh use our tests to detect it earlier so that mm -hmm. they can take action and then actually next week we're publishing um a gestational diabetes biomarker um, to to see if you your microbiome has a signature for that or a higher predisposition for GDM. Right. Um, in women, that's the thing. Like we we don't know what 
or all the tests that we are going to take during pregnancy uh-huh. uh, until we get pregnant. And then it's a little bit too late then because if we test positive for something like the glucose drink that you have to mm-hmm. take in, I think, the 25th week or something. Yeah, between 25 and 28 weeks around there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, then it's like, you know, it's, it's very influenced by diet and exercise, but there's some genetic component, obviously. Sure. But if you find out at 25 weeks, there's just not too many weeks to to modify it, right? And then you do the second test. And then if you do get gestation diabetes, then you, you may have to take certain drugs, which also is not great for the mom and the baby. So we have a gestational diabetes biomarker coming out uh, where if you are really early on in your pregnancy before that 25 weeks, or if you're trying to conceive, you can see if you have a slightly higher risk for that. And you can already start to take action and change your diet and take certain supplements to address that, uh, certain probiotics. So, so that's kind of why, again, emphasizing early testing is crucial. Um, and then, so you might want to do another test towards, uh, you know, the end of your pregnancy to see right. if those changes have been addressed, uh, but you don't have to. Um, but the more important thing is then when the baby's born, you want to take a seven day test for the baby to stool test, mm-hmm. because that gives you the best picture of what seeded the baby um, at birth and whether or not some of your microbes transfer it because there's um, again literature showing that the more microbes transfer from the mom Uh the better the health of the baby and nature has it such that when the microbes come from the mom they're usually beneficial microbes not Uh, unfriendly microbes gotcha gotcha yeah the baby gets unfriendly microbes from the environment whether it's the hospital the doctors the Mm -hmm. partner Mm -hmm. gotcha gotcha yeah so are there are there some specific key microbes that you are looking for, either that are present or absent during pregnancy and for the baby? Yes, yes. So in the gut bacteria, we're looking for bifidobacteria. And again, this may sound familiar because bifidobacteria is very commonly found in probiotics. Mm-hmm. You know, really you find mostly two, three kinds, which is lactobacillus based, more for the vaginal health. And uh, bifidobacteria, bifidobacteria mm-hmm. is a mouthful. You may find some bacillus spore-based probiotics, but that's not going to colonize your baby's gut at birth usually. So bifidobacteria is what we want to see transferring to baby. And this bacteria should be 30 to 90% of the baby's community in the first year. Okay. And it's very protective. It trains the baby's immune system. It's very efficient at digesting the HMOs in breast milk, the human milk oligosaccharides. So a third of your breast milk is made of HMOs, mm-hmm. and this is prebiotics or food to the probiotics or mm-hmm. the bifidobacteria. So um, even if the mom is breastfeeding, the baby the baby can't digest the HMOs in the mom's um, breast milk. It's the bacteria that digests it. Gotcha. Which is really fascinating. Like again, proving the point that you are feeding not the baby; you're feeding the baby's bacteria. Right. So if the mom didn't have the, you know, we look for four specific strains of bifidobacteria. Mm-hmm. So it's B. Breve, B. Longum, B. Infantis, and B. Bifidum. Because these are the most efficient at digesting the HMOs in breast milk. Okay. So if the mom didn't successfully transfer these bacteria strains to the baby, then the HMOs are not being digested properly or as efficiently and that leaves room for pathogenic bacteria to inhabit and colonize the baby's gut. So we see some guts being colonized by 90% of unfriendly bacteria mm. at birth. And if this rate continues to be high over time in the first six months or first year, then the baby's gut is in a pro-inflammatory state for too long. And okay. that is what triggers a lot of chronic conditions like eczema, gotcha, gotcha, allergies. Gotcha. So the mom-baby connection is so crucial, and the type of bacteria is so crucial. Gotcha. Is this too technical so no, far? No, this is perfect. This is perfect. 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 Um, so, are there things that are there reasons that you see why moms may not have some of the good bacteria yeah. anymore? Yeah, like I mentioned, I didn't have it, and I was crushed when I found out. <laughs> I did such good care of my gut. I'm eating all the right foods. Right. But then I 
was like, okay, we always think we're healthier than we actually are. <laughs> and when I, when I properly think back, I'm like, okay, I really just changed my diet in the last year, bef- like, you know, when I was pregnant. And mm-hmm. before that, you really look back, I'm like, okay, I wasn't that healthy. <laughs> you know? so, you know, is one of those things, or trying to consume is one of those things that will really change you, right? Your right. lifestyle and your diet. Right. So that's not enough time. I mean, you need, like, you know, I have had 30 plus years of maybe a less healthy diet mm-hmm. uh, and, and, you know, it takes time. So that's why we, we see it early. So mom's diet for sure, but even more so um, antibiotic exposure. Mm-hmm. The younger you are, again, if you had antibiotic exposure in the first 1,000 days as a child, so between birth to about two, three years old, mm-hmm. the more antibiotics you were exposed to as a child, um, the the less likely you will still have those bifidobacteria if you're not taking action to restore it um, after the treatment, after uh, um, exposure through diet or supplements, then you may not even have it. Um, and then formula feeding, as I mentioned, I, I learned I had no idea in the eighties. Uh, you know, formula was really popular, right? So it wasn't, you know, my mom was told she couldn't breastfeed and that she wouldn't have enough supply for her baby. So she was just like, okay, let's just, just formula feed. So right. again, as I mentioned, the bifidobacteria continues to transfer through breast milk. So without that, you know, the baby may not be getting it from the mom. Mm-hmm. Um, and that impact, frankly, there's so much emphasis on the birth, right? But that is a one-time transfer, which is still really crucial. And, and the pioneering microbes really chart the way for all the preceding microbes. Right. The breastfeeding is so impactful because it's done over six months, ideally, right? Or, or maybe a year if the mom goes beyond six months, that's a lot of time to continue seeding the baby with your microbes. So that process is generational. So if, if you know, and the mom continues to pass on the microbes to the baby. So if that was, that chain was somehow affected in, in the process, then you know, you know, that, that could affect uh, future generations. Okay. Um, so those are some things, lifestyle, you know, now we're exposed to so many toxins, microplastics, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, like heavy metals mm-hmm. found in the mom and, and breast milk too. Right. So microbiome is one factor and a huge factor because 80% of our immune system is in our gut, but there could be so many hormonal factors and toxins that could also affect it. Yeah. It's interesting. My, my, my mom, my parents actually, but my mom grew up like in the country and like they used to grow all of their food for the most part. Like her grandmother just grew stuff where they lived. And like when she ate meat, like her grandmother would just go out in the yard and grab a chicken and kill it and they would eat it. And so she's like, now these people, like we thought we were poor and that's how we were living. But now actually that's how everybody's trying to go back to because you realize that that's sort of getting your food from as close to the ground as possible. And with, you know, as few pesticides and all of those things and toxins is actually healthy for you. 100%. 100%. We're, we're starting a farm. My mom's planting vegetables in the yard again. And we're thinking about chickens as well. Right. I sort of our meat from really um, you know, healthy farms around here. Uh, yeah, there's something to be said about the soil, right? If you think about mm-hmm. micro- microbial diversity, where does it come from? If your produce is being triple washed, even if it's organic, there's maybe not much, you know, not nutrients, but like maybe the the kind of bacterial community is right. is sterilized, right? It's no right. longer there. So there's definitely something to be said about going to your yard, plucking it out, and you're mm-hmm. going to get that microbial diverse soil yeah. diversity. Yeah, absolutely, gut. absolutely. So I have two kits myself, and I have not tested. And honestly, I was been thinking about like, why have I not done this? And honestly, I think it's because I'm a little bit scared about what the results are going to show. Like, is my microbiome going to be horrible? So for the audience, can you tell us like, when people test and when they get the results back, what did the reports like? What are the things that you can tell them to help them deal with the results of the reports? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They, we get plenty of different reactions. Um, surprised, um, mm-hmm. relief, all kinds of reactions, but I think most of our moms are very motivated. Um, maybe they had a prior gut issue and they already know maybe something is funky and they are really, really eager to improve it and they mm-hmm. want to learn how. So they look to us to give them that actionable recommendations. Right. 
And we do have recommendations from a dietary supplement or lifestyle perspective. And it's your choice if you want to you want to address it through a diet, dietary manner, which takes a longer time, but more natural or supplements, right? right? Some people just want the quick route, but Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I I believe it's a combination. You have to change all of them for it to have long lasting impact. Sure. So a lot of our moms are very motivated and especially when you have a baby and if your baby is exhibiting some symptoms like colicky, gassiness, you know, frequent crying, frequent weakings, Mm. also um, sleep issues, has a strong microbiome connection, uh, we we can give them some answers for what's causing it, what's uh, maybe not causing it because there's a correlation, but we don't know ca- ca- causation. Um, but at least we're giving them some answers from a root cause perspective, what right. is maybe underlying imbalances that are causing these symptoms, right? So a lot of them are very motivated to, to kind of take action. And like, mm-hmm. like my story, I felt empowered by the results, not, mm-hmm. not scared. Um, and I don't know, maybe you feel a little pressure that you might have to share with your audience that you can, you don't have to, like, I think, <laughs> and I think there's a little bit of, um, um, I don't know, like, like some of, uh, we work with some influencers who are very holistic and, you know, they have, you know, taken care of their diet and right. health for years and they've gotten rid of chemicals right. and also sometimes have this apprehension, oh gosh, like what if my results come back? Not so good. Right. And some of them like are really good because they're like, okay, like they, they've done a lot to restore their gut and it reflects. But some of that, some, some, st- some things are um, like hard, really hard to address. Right. And maybe the, the protocols you've been doing, the probiotics or supplements you've been taking are the not, the, not the right strain that you've been, your, your body lacks. So again, that this is where testing is empowering because then you can actually, change your protocol um, and what will actually help your gut or your vaginal microbiome. Um, so we, we, we think that in the future, like um, nutrition and supplements should be personalized. Mm. And why not? It, why is it a one size fits all? Take sure. this premium, take this probiotic, take, you know, so, but what if your body actually needs different strains, different nutrients, right? Um, so we hope that our test is more empowering in that once you know with the microbiome, you can fix it because it changes, right? Even though as an adult, we always say that an adult microbiome is much harder to modify. It's right. really, it's possible. It's not like a genetic test. I think gen- genetic tests are more scary because it's inherited. You can't inherited. do anything about it. Right, right. You can't do anything about it. But with the microbiome, you absolutely can. And I can share my story. So um, I, I told you I didn't have that bifidobacteria stream mm-hmm. to transfer my baby. I, through some evidence-based findings that we, we have, and now we're recommending it to our uh, community um, customers, I managed to go from 0. Point, I think 1% uh-huh. to 5% of okay. the bacteria strain <laughs> that I was lacking. And now I have it in healthy amounts. And, and then my vaginal community, I found out, was not great either. It was not lactobacillus dominated. It was dominated by the not so good kind. And so I did some suppository and I took the, um, you know, some vaginal probiotics. The Mm -hmm. first round for two months, it didn't show any improvement. It showed very slight improvement. It was a little bit disheartened. Then I did another four months. So it took me six months, Mm. hard work. And finally I'm at 98% um, community state type one. So I'm at a a really good community now. So it took time, but I got, I got there. So there's, there's hope and there's, gotcha. uh, yeah, success stories. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And in the reports, you're giving people those specific things that they can do to, to change and to improve. Um, and then speaking of results, I'm curious, what are some of the most like surprising results or things that you've seen as, as a result of these tests? Yeah. Yeah. And it's all related. I'm glad you asked that. So again, we would have expected that the, the babies of that were born by a C-section or maybe formula fat had maybe not not as great of a gut, um, but that's not always what we find. So even mm. vaginally born and sometimes home births, um, exclusively 100% fat, breast fat babies, mm. guts that don't look good. And Wait, like, really? Like vaginal birth and even home birth? 
And when we look at the baby's gut, they have a strong C-section signature. That's interesting. Um, and so this is where we ask for reactions from parents. They uh-huh. are disappointed when they get the results back and they're surprised. They're like, you know, I don't understand. So we, we always tell them, well, this is what the results show. Um, we don't know why, but we would highly encourage that you test your gut too. Right. So then the mom tests her gut and then we do see that the bifidobacteria strain that I was talking about mm-hmm. missing, oftentimes okay. missing. Okay. Again, if that didn't pass on because the mom didn't have it to begin with, then the the environment of the gut isn't it, it's more fearable to pathogenic bacteria to colonize. So you know it's not a guarantee. Birth modes, feeding modes. Um, although we you know it's still you know better for baby for various reasons, like breast milk, for example, right. has hormones and antibodies and other nutrition for the baby but the bacteria component is often maybe not talked not talked about enough that that part is important too wow. so that's kind of what, again i know it's a lot of weight i think the, the thing that is hard is there's so much weight already to the mom and then this is yet another thing so sometimes we are very conscious about that at tiny health um when we talk about the mom baby connection because we do see you know again the science is is kind of you know, supporting that connection, mom, maybe connection much more. However, um, when we see our families test, they want to test dad too, and they want to test the older siblings and all that. And so other family members definitely have an impact on the baby's gut too. So, so it is primarily the mom because of the birth and the breastfeeding, but other family members, if they have gut inflammation or if they have high levels of pathogenic bacteria that can also impact the baby. Yeah, for sure. I think there's definitely not, I think, I know there's definitely some research that shows that families microbiomes may be similar. Mm -hmm. So just because they live in the same environment or exposed to the same thing. So that totally, totally makes sense. Mm -hmm. So as we wrap up, what would you say is the most frustrating part of your work? Um, you know, we, we started, uh, we launched our product about six months ago. So not, not to, we're a very new company and, and thank you again for being a part of our advisory board. You've been amazing as our medical advisor. Oh, well, thank you. Um, yeah. So we have, I think the, maybe the frustrating part is in the earlier days, as we're developing the reports, as you may know, some of these terms and bacteria names are pretty foreign to people. So there's a mm-hmm. lot of education that we need to do. Um, and and constantly changing how we project the or how we display the results and information. Right. So early on, it was frustrating when uh, maybe a report came back and the baby's gut didn't look too good, and there was really actionable ways, especially early on, where the parent could address the the imbalance. But maybe our report was too complicated, and that point was missed. Gotcha. And the parent didn't take action or unsubscribe and, and all that. So that was really frustrating. Now we've come a long way improving our product and make it really clear. Every report comes with an expert review. Really, someone, our medical doctor um, on board, uh, she's a pediatrician and microbiologist, mm-hmm. uh, hand writes each note for the, the parent to really emphasize which is the biggest impact thing that they can do right now for their gut or their baby's gut and and you know offer consult calls so that has improved our recommendations tremendously so in a way for most frustrating part is mm-hmm. if a point was missed where we could have you know even maybe prevented a chronic condition for the child gotcha. and then the most rewarding part is when we do you know we see a resample the baby's gut maybe not looking super great initially and that changing 180 right and or the baby's symptoms or conditions going away, improving, or the mom getting results like I did where I had zero and now I have 5%. Right. Um, and then them being so happy to see that. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. I can imagine. So what is your favorite piece of advice that you would like to give to expectant moms, expectant families? Um, hmm. Well, if there's one takeaway is that if there's, if there's anything that you can change is the gut microbiome, mm. frankly, and to really pay attention to it in the first 1,000 days, which, by the way, starts during conception. So the child, the baby's uh, first 1,000 days starts in a womb till the baby is about two years of age. Right, right. So what you do as a, as a mom carrying the baby, 
is so impactful to the baby and your own health too. Sure. So with microbiome, it is malleable and it's changeable and you can restore no matter how you know seemingly bad your gut is, um, you can you can change it. So really it is it is what I learn that is so empowering. And this is what I, you know, wanted to bring to other parents. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. I love it. So where can people find Tiny Health and the kits and um, all of that good, great stuff? Yeah, we are at tinyhealth.com. So check out our website uh, and our science page, or you can read about my story and my about page. And then we have a whole family suite of um, gut tests. And then follow us on Instagram to get educational bits of information so that's at at tiny.health okay all right awesome well thank you so much cheryl i am so thrilled that you were able to come on and have this conversation i know folks are going to find it useful thank you nicole and i'm going to do my testing i'm going to do my testing (laughs) yes and then maybe we'll come back and review it if you want (laughs) absolutely absolutely Wasn't that a great conversation? I loved having that conversation with Cheryl. She's so knowledgeable and passionate about her work and very serious. And I just am so excited to be a part of the company and this amazing work that is being done. Now, you know, after every episode, I have something called Dr. Nicole's Notes, where I talk about my top three or four takeaways from the conversation. And here are my Dr. Nicole's Notes from my conversation with Cheryl. Number one, I want to be clear that the microbiome and how it affects health is an emerging area for sure. So do keep that in mind if you decide to do these tests. This isn't information that's completely set in stone. We're learning. There's a lot of data um, that is uh, suggestive and supportive and um, really encouraging in terms of how the microbiome affects health, but it is still emerging. So keep that in mind that you're participating in something as that's emerging if you do these tests. However, like I said, I believe it's really important. And as time goes on, we're going to just learn more and more about the importance of how the microbiome affects our health. One of the areas that we're learning outside of pregnancy and birth is how it affects GI conditions like ulcerative colitis, um, actually fecal transplants to change bacteria are very good cures for, for a specific bacterial infection called Clostridium difficile. So um, I really think this is this is an important area and um, I'm excited to be on the forefront of it as well. I also appreciate this is helping you put your health in your own hands. You can do these kits at home. You don't have to have someone in between to, um, you know, order the test or anything like that. So do keep those things in mind. All right. Number two, living your most healthy life is a journey and it takes time. Cheryl talked about how it took her months to see changes in her microbiome and it can take work sometimes. So give yourself grace in terms of your health and well-being, and just keep putting one foot in front of the other when you're working on things to improve yourself and improve your health. Like right now, I am on the struggle bus with my weight. I am the heaviest that I have been as an adult and my willpower has sucked to like, buckle down and lose it. I've lost it before. I lost weight before, um, around my 40th birthday, but I can't seem to get it together and, you know, do the things and track food and, um, that, that, that I know will help me, me do it. But we, I keep trying, you come back at it. So just keep learning, keep growing into your best self. And that's whether it's during pregnancy, when you're trying to eat well or move your body, or whether you're trying to lose postpartum weight, just give yourself some grace. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Change takes time and just be patient with yourself. All right. And then the third thing that I'm going to say is I'm actually finally going to do my test. As I mentioned in the episode, I've been hesitant to do it. I think I've just been like fearful of the results for some reason. Like what if it comes out that my microbiome is really, really crappy, then I don't know, maybe I'll be embarrassed or I don't know, but I'm going to do my test the week that the episode airs and it airs, this is airing on November 15th. So I'm going to be sharing my experience with doing 
both the vaginal test and the gut test in my Instagram stories. So if you were listening to it during that week, check out my Instagram stories where I'll be sharing my experience of doing both the vaginal and the gut test. And again, if you are interested in doing the test, then head to tinyhealth.com. Use the code Dr. Nicole to get that discount. All right. So there you have it. Do me a solid. Share this podcast with a friend. Sharing is caring. It helps me to reach and serve more pregnant folks, which I so appreciate. That is the heart, soul, and passion of my work. And if you can help me do that work, I would so appreciate that. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to me right now. Leave me a review in Apple podcast in particular helps the show to grow. And I love to hear what you think about the show or just shoot me a message about the show as well. Folks shoot me a message on Instagram or email. And speaking of Instagram, come follow me on Instagram. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Nicole Rankins and I provide great pregnancy birth tips there as well. And that is it for this episode. Do come on back next week and remember that you deserve a beautiful pregnancy and birth.